morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Public Health Ontario Microbiology Rounds presentation on progress and challenges in implementing a tuberculosis genomic epidemiology program. My name is Melissa Richard Greenblatt, and I am a clinical microbiologist at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. So before we get started, I just wanted to mention some of our usual housekeeping items. To enhance the presentation experience, participant audio and video has been disabled. The chat pod has been deactivated to limit any distractions during the presentation. Please use the Q&A pod if you have any questions either during or after the session. A discussion and question period will also follow the presentation to answer these questions. If at any point during the session you experience technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. And I would also like to finally state that as a moderator of this session, I do not have any conflicts of interest to declare. So it is now my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's presentation, Dr. Jennifer Guthrie. Dr. Guthrie is an assistant professor at the University of Western Ontario in the departments of microbiology and immunology and epidemiology and biostatistics. She is also an adjunct scientist at Public Health Ontario. Her research interests include pathogen genomics and bioinformatics to study infectious disease emergence and transmission to support public health responses to outbreaks. And I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Guthrie. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Melissa, uh, for the opportunity to talk to everyone today about uh, one of my research passions, and that's tuberculosis genomic epi. I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about building and uh, implementing a tuberculosis genomic epi program. Uh, so just to note that I do not have any uh, financial or conflicts of interest. Uh, so I hope by the end of today's uh, discussion, we'll be able to explain genomic epidemiology in plain language, describe how genomic epidemiology is applied to public health using a real world example, and discuss the challenges in implementing a tuberculosis genomic epidemiology program. So probably most of you that have joined today are very familiar with the term epidemiology. So this is the study and analysis of the distributions uh, and patterns and determinants of health and disease conditions in a defined population. However, there's a newer field called genomic epidemiology. So very similar, there's a number of different definitions. Many people would say it's the use of pathogen genomic data to determine distribution and spread of an infectious disease in a specified population and its application to public health decision making. This involves microbiology, genomics, epidemiology, and at the heart of it is uh, bioinformatics. There are a number of applications of genomic epidemiology. So we use it for population level surveillance. So we can monitor variants to inform vaccine development. Uh, outbreak detection in many cases. So sometimes there are no sort of obvious or known connections where genomics can help uh, with other information to link hospital cases for an outbreak or investigation to identify in the case of say a foodborne outbreak, what is the source uh, for infection control. Um, genomic epidemiology has been used to identify and pinpoint contaminated hospital equipment that's been causing infection. And I think the one uh, we're all very familiar with these days is tracking the spread of a pathogen locally to globally. So in the case of SARS-CoV-2. So one of the cornerstones of genomic epidemiology is whole genome sequencing. So without getting into much of the laboratory detail of what's involved, in the case of, say, a tuberculosis, uh, a, a specimen is received uh, in the laboratory and a culture is grown of that and then DNA extracted. From there, we use uh, a number of techniques to be able to prepare the DNA. Uh, and this can, in some cases, take a couple of days, then to be able to put it on a genome sequencer. 
From there, we get what we call reads. So in the case of tuberculosis, it's a more than 4 million base pair genome. So more than 4 million A, C, Gs, and Ts. And so we uh, get shorter pieces of that. And then after the sequencing, we have to sort of map that back in the, in the case of TB to a reference genome. So you can kind of think of that as doing a jigsaw puzzle uh, where you put the, the picture of your uh, puzzle and then you try and put all the pieces together uh, so that you get your full picture. Uh, I would say it's similar to that, except for obviously with biology, it's not so straightforward. Uh, and from there, we can identify differences. So variants or mutations, or sometimes referred to as single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And so in pink uh, here, we see that this is their reference genome, and there's a bunch of reads. So this would be from one single sample where they kind of get stacked together, unlike a jigsaw puzzle where you would put them back together and identify that in this position, there's a T, which varies from sort of our reference strain. So where does bioinformatics come into this? Well, we have DNA extraction, library prep, genome sequencing, and then we get this raw read data. And then some stuff happens in between, that's the bioinformatics, and then you get SNP identification and phylogenomics, so those nice pretty trees that everybody is seeing with uh, COVID. And uh, so the bioinformatics uh, involves a lot of different pieces, and it can depend on what your ultimate goal is, if you're looking at metagenomics in which you sample sort of every pathogen or every organism that might be in a sample, or if you do from isolate, which we generally do for tuberculosis, and that you have a pure culture, and then you probably are going to do a reference-based assembly, as I mentioned, where you sort of know uh, your kind of your loose uh, way to make back, bring back your genome that's similar to sort of your reference genome. Uh, and then again, depending on what you're doing, you can do a number of different workflows to say identify the lineage of it or uh, identify antimicrobial resistance genes and so on. So this all looks quite simple uh, in reality. There we go. Uh, it looks a lot like this. So it's a lot of code, uh, uh, command line code. Uh, and depending on what you're doing can take minutes to hours to days, or sometimes some of the analysis that I can take, take several weeks to run. The genomes being quite large. So I'm going to switch to talk specifically about tuberculosis. So for those of you unfamiliar, it's a bacterial infection caused by the bacteria Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It primarily causes a respiratory infection, although we've been able to isolate TB from pretty much every site in the body. It's transmitted through airborne droplets from an individual that has an active infectious form of TB. Um, but there is a, a latent or sort of a dormant uh, stage of this disease, which many people will stay in and never what we call reactivate and have an active disease in which they require treatment and uh, would be able to transmit. So only about 5 to 10% of people who are exposed and infected will go on to develop an active TB infection uh, at some point in their lifetime. Uh, the thing to know is that those who do, it's often related to uh, immunocompromising, whether it be medications or conditions, or as people age, the immune system uh, does, it does decrease, and so you have a, a greater chance of a, a latent infection sort of waking up and becoming an active infection and requiring treatment. Now, many people, when I say that I work on tuberculosis, say, hasn't that been eradicated? Why do you work on this old disease? Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't be further from the truth. So globally, there's about 10 million new cases every year, and the mortality is quite high, 1.6 million deaths annually. So what that means is in non-pandemic times, tuberculosis is the number one infectious disease killer in the world. Now, in Canada, we're considered a low incidence country. So our rate generally sits around five, a little bit less than five per 100,000, although we're uncertain how the pandemic has affected that. And it will take a couple of years probably to fully realize uh, what's happened. Now, it is not evenly distributed across the country. So different provinces and territories have much different rates. And even within those, uh, there are pockets of communities in which there's very high rates of tuberculosis. 
Yukon Territory, I'm going to talk specifically about some work that I did in Yukon and in Yukon, and they have uh, in absolute numbers, not uh, a, a lot of cases because they have a small population, but in incidence rate, uh, they're definitely well above the national rate. So this takes us to tuberculosis genomic epidemiology. So for an individual with an active infection in which the bacteria is able to be cultured in the laboratory, we extract the DNA. And then in the past, we did uh, what we call molecular genotyping techniques in which we can use these to strain type and cluster and potentially identify chains of transmission or at least clusters of potential transmission cases. There are a number of different methods used. So RFLP uh, creates sort of this very nice image fingerprinting type technique. Uh, Miro Vinter is the most common and widely used and is still used today. And spalibotyping, lesser used. Now these pictures are not to scale, but essentially they're looking at different regions of the genome and able to differentiate, uh, say in the case of Miro Vinter, the number of repeats and different strains will have different numbers of repetitive sequences at these different loci across the genome. So we use 24 different loci for discriminatory discriminate between different strains of uh, TB. Uh, and then genomics, we look at virtually all of the genome. So obviously this has the highest discriminatory power. However, uh, as I mentioned, it's quite involved both in the technique and the laboratory side of things, as well as in the analysis side. So some of these other ones can be a little bit quicker, but they may not offer the same level of uh, discrimination between strains. So this is some work that I did in British Columbia. And so this is based on the genotyping. So this is Miro Vinter in a minimum spanning tree. So I'll walk you through this. Essentially, we have four sort of larger groups here with a name. So East Asian, Euro-American, Indo-Oceanic, East African Indian. So these are the more the four largest, most common cluster, or sorry, lineages that we see uh, in Canada and in North America in general. Uh, there's a very strong phylogeographic association for tuberculosis. So it is co-evolved with humans. And so the geography of it and the, the strain typing often matches. So if an individual is from, uh, say, uh, Philippines, they are very highly likely to have an Indo-Oceanic strain. Europeans went everywhere in the world. So unfortunately, your American strain is seen all over. So the colors indicate the birthplace of the individual with tuberculosis and the circles, the larger the circle, the more cases. So in this large pink ones, the more number of individuals that shared the exact same genotype. So they are clustered. So the Euro-American, we have a number of very large clusters. These actually represent outbreaks that have occurred in the province, and the large proportion of them are all Canadian born. We do see some larger circles, uh, as you can see, say in Indo-Oceanic. So one of the issues with the genotyping technique is that it was uh, created by an individual uh, researcher in uh, France, and so most of the strains he had to work with were Euro-American. And so the the loci that were chosen, the 24 loci for Miro Vinter, uh, are biased towards your American, so it works better to differentiate between strains. So when we uh, then look at those clusters and we whole genome sequence them, we can start to track transmission within a, a genotype cluster. So in this case, you would read this uh, horizontally where we have patients, say, 1 through 12. And you can see there's a mutation uh, here, the T, uh, that is different. So this is probably a transmission cluster. So as bacteria replicate, mutations arise. And sort of over the short time scale of an outbreak and absent of selected selection pressures, so they will uh, accrue in sort of a neutral fashion according to a molecular clock. So every pathogen is going to have a different molecular clock. In the case of tuberculosis, we expect to see about one mutation every two years. So it's very slow growing compared to, say, something like COVID, so SARS-CoV-2, in which we're looking at the time scale of weeks to see that number of mutations. So the patterns of shared mutations can suggest transmission events. 
And then when we add in contact investigation and key clinical and demographic data, we can start to piece together person-to-person -person transmission. Now, if only they all lined up nicely for us in the data and it was this straightforward in which you just can uh, easily see each uh, mutation as it arises in person to person, and uh, then you can identify your chains of transmission. Unfortunately, it doesn't often work out quite that nicely, but I am going to show you an example uh, where we actually have pretty good uh, idea of the transmission. So in a remote circumpolar region in Canada, uh, Yukon Territory. So this is a very large uh, geographical area, but the population is very small. So I was wondering uh, if we do genomics in this region, uh, is it going to offer them anything new? So we often see genome sequencing as sort of the hammer for every nail. But when you have a remote setting with really good epidemiological data, the individuals in healthcare working there know these patients very, very well. So does genomics offer anything to them? So the goal of the project was to use a small, well-defined population to examine molecular and genomic epidemiology and reconstruct transmission events. So this became part of a larger project in British Columbia, uh, where TB isolates for more than 2,000 uh, uh, isolates from frozen stocks were grown and DNA extracted, genotyping performed, and whole genome sequencing was done for those that uh, were identified to be in a cluster. So then we did the analysis, and what happened is we had two teams. So one team led by myself was the genomics team, in which we looked at the whole genome sequencing results and had very minimal data uh, in terms of the cases, maybe sort of uh, when the sample was collected, that date, things like that. And then the second team was based in Yukon. So these are the, the case managers and nurses who normally uh, uh, deal with the care and treatment of these individuals and have uh, one of the nurses had been in the territory more than 30 years uh, and knew all the patients very well. And so separately, we put together what we thought transmission wise may have happened. Uh, first, though, I looked at the genomic clusters. So by integrating the genomic results of British Columbia and Yukon Territory and created a minimum spanning tree to visualize the genomic clusters to kind of get a sense of where Yukon falls within this. One of the things I didn't mention uh, is that Yukon Territory, unlike some of the other northern regions, uh, has year-round road access. It might be snowy roads, but they are open, unlike some areas where uh, it's only fly-in, fly-out, or sometimes not at all if the weather's bad enough. So that means that uh, people can move between different communities. They can go to Whitehorse. The people can go down to British Columbia, which they often do to visit family, to seek health care, uh, work, and so on. So there's quite the connection between Yukon and BC. So what we see here is that there are some clusters like 19 that is blue, and that's all Yukon cases. So it doesn't seem to be any mix of British Columbia cases in here. This one in cluster one, there does seem to be a little bit of a mix, but the Yukon cluster seems to be a little bit distinct uh, gen uh, genotypically or genomically. Um, cluster four, there's just one individual. Uh, so what we did is looked at where we thought acquisition may have happened, but then we looked deeper. And this is the outcome of when we had our meeting. So the two groups, the genomic group and the, the um, patient care group, to identify transmission uh, chains as we saw it with our data together. And then I'll talk about separate. So we were able to identify three genomically distinct clusters representing transmission uh, within the territory. Uh, there were some BC cases involved. So you'll see in BC, these are gray and in blue, these are Yukon cases. Uh, so cluster 19, this is this one that uh, is pretty um, unique in terms of the genomics. So it doesn't match anybody in British Columbia. Um, and you'll see that there's not even any mutations. So these little black dots are represent the number of mutations. So they're genetically identical. So clearly uh, an outbreak's happened here. Um, and then this individual is somebody who uh, probably was infected many, many years prior um, of what is locally circulating and has uh, reactivated at a much later date. 
You know, this cluster in particular, uh, this made sense because this uh, location in which this community is, is very much sort of off the beaten track, meaning that they probably don't have a lot of mixtures between other communities uh, and BC. So it wasn't surprising uh, to the individuals, uh, the nursing staff and so on in Yukon to see that this one was very genetically distinct from the rest. Uh, cluster nine is quite interesting that we have definitely a super spreading uh, individual. So in this sort of round, uh, or the red circle here indicates that they were uh, highly infectious. Essentially, they have what we call cavitary smear positive disease. Uh, and so they spread TB, unfortunately, through a number of events uh, to both Yukon individuals and uh, BC. So they were sick in BC and then have come up to Yukon um, to spend time. Uh, there. And unfortunately, uh, we have a lot of cases uh, right away or pretty soon after, and then even some that have shown up uh, years later. Cluster one is probably was the most challenging to put together. So uh, there was some debate as to uh, which sort of uh, individual may have spread to sort of downstream individuals. And so when you looked at uh, quite deep at the genome sequencing and put all the information. So you'll see there's one pink circle here. So one mutation. And what that represented is a mixed position. So uh, when we look across, so these are all the reads for an individual sample. So that individual's TV isolate. And so here we see that there are both A's and C's. So meaning that there was either a mixed infection in that they were acquired sort of two slightly different, I guess, strains or variants of that, uh, or they we've sort of discovered them and sampled them at a time where the bacteria was starting to mutate, but not all of them had yet. So when we put all the data together, we were able to identify um, both in time and space that the people with an A here, so the BC case and a number of Yukon cases had an A at this particular position in the genome. And so basically we've taken, you know, the 4 million bases uh, that are identical and taken those out. And we're just focusing on the ones where there was some variation between these cases. Then we have that individual that had what we call a minor variant, so sort of a mixture. And then everyone after this individual then had a C at that position. And so based on what they knew about the individual and their contact with other people in this cluster uh, and sort of their social circle and so on, uh, and we were able to determine that the most likely thing was that we had sampled this individual at a point in time in which the C position was sort of, um, uh, sort of taking over the bacterial population in their lungs, uh, but we still could see remnants of the A. And so that put that person as the most likely source case there. So when we looked at how well we did between the genomic team and the sort of uh, field, I guess, epi team, we'll call them, we were pretty good. 82% of whole genome sequencing matched in the location of acquisition, meaning in BC, in Yukon, what particular community in Yukon we thought that they had probably acquired their infection in. However, in source case identification, uh, it varied highly by cluster. And to be honest, the genomics did not do a great job. So when we asked the Yukon folks, okay, how did this go for you? Would you want to use genomics? How would you use genomics in the future? They said program assessment was probably a good area for them to be able to uh, assess the effectiveness of their treatment and prevention program. So one quote is, that they said many of these confirmed our suspicions. And then uh, it said it was nice to know this was a reactivation and not a contact of a missed source. So they found that very helpful to have that genomics to sort of understand how they are doing in their program. They also had some trouble with accuracy. So we had, uh, they already had the Miravinter results because 
that uh, genotyping technique has been used in BC and Yukon for a number of years. So we left them that, that information. However, it didn't always line up with some of the known epi connections and the genomics. And so they felt that the genomics was an improvement and the quote was to have had the WGS data, so the whole genome sequencing data, would have saved many hours of discussion, would have helped to focus the discussion by narrowing the list of potential sources. So they did feel that genomics did have something to offer them. Uh, in many cases, confirmation, which is still quite nice uh, to know that what they thought had happened and who, who had probably been a source case was indeed the case. Uh, and so now this has been fully implemented to have genomics uh, for uh, Yukon territory. But how do you implement a genomic epidemiology program? So kind of a look before you leap. What are the considerations that you need to have uh, before you try and implement a program? So Yukon territory being quite small and quite small number of cases, uh, it's um, a bit of an easier task to do that. And so, and uh, that involves BC because all the isolates go to British Columbia. But if you want a widespread, uh, whether it be surveillance or outbreak detection and so on, there are a number of considerations. So the first of which uh, is that you need to, whoops, okay, we'll do two. Um, so is that you need to infer transmission, you need a really well sampled outbreak, meaning samples should be available for the majority of the outbreak cases. Now this is difficult sometimes, especially as we move more and more towards molecular based tests and pathogens that may be detected by serology. So you never have a culture available to do whole genome sequencing. Or in the case of say uh, COVID-19 where people have rapid tests and don't go to get a PCR test, the laboratory has no sample whatsoever to be able to do whole genome sequencing. So in that case, you know, depending on what you want to do, if you want to do outbreak detection, then that's going to be tricky if you don't have sufficient number of samples to really be able to identify uh, an outbreak and person-to-person -person transmission within that. Um, so the other thing, of course, uh, as we all know, is cost. So it's uh, costs have come down considerably, but it's still pretty pricey to be able to do whole genome sequencing and not just the whole genome sequencing, all the other pieces of a genomic epidemiology program. So the cost can run you anywhere from probably about 100 to 250 to sequence a bacterial isolate. Uh, that doesn't include your upstream laboratory costs in terms of uh, the personnel and the culturing of an organism. Uh, that's really starting from, say, your DNA extraction onwards and the actual uh, raw data. And then you have downstream analysis and infrastructure costs. Uh, the other things that you need to consider there we go, is interpretability. So can you readily interpret in an epidemiological context? So what I mean by that is there are some pathogens that recombine a lot. And those might have mobile, what we call mobile elements, so pieces of DNA that they swap back and forth. So in that case, those types of pathogens, it is really difficult, if not impossible, to determine person-to-person -person transmission with any level of certainty. The other thing that needs to be kept in mind is that SNP thresholds to infer transmission, they will vary between organism. Uh, and so that needs to be kept in mind uh, in, as part of the bioinformatics analysis uh, to know that um, not, uh, not everything is easily interpretable. So data, do you have access to uh, clinical and uh, epidemiological case level data, things like symptom onset date uh, and uh, where they reside and or where they work or where they ate lunch if they are uh, looking at a food outbreak. So you need access to that data and you need to be able to to link that data. So is there a common linker? So that data may exist, but if you can't link it to your specimen level data, then it doesn't really help you. Uh, expertise is a big one. So do you have a genomic epidemiologist on hand uh, to extract 
meaningful, actionable information from genomic epidemiology. It's not enough just to run, you know, bioinformatics tools. Instead, the person that is interpreting the results needs to have an understanding of the disease, its epidemiology, and appreciate sort of the unique parts of the genome. So every pathogen's genome, particularly if you're you know, an expert in one uh, pathogen, it takes a long time to learn and become an expert in another pathogen. Uh, each genome has its own little quirks. And if you don't consider that, so for tuberculosis, there are a number of interesting things in repetitive regions and so on that cause some issues in, uh, in the bioinformatics. And if you don't take those into account, uh, it's very well that you will make wrong conclusions from the analysis. And of course, really, you need to also consider um, why, I guess, that you're doing uh, genomic epidemiology, that uh, it's really effective when there's a clear outcome. Oops, just the key to it. Um, so you want to uh, think about what are you planning on doing with this data? So what is the public health relevance? Uh, are you trying to implement infection control freeze? procedures, identify a source of infection, change outbreak management guidelines, uh, or surveillance resources. So you can have all the other things in place and say, yep, we have the money, we have the expertise, but really if you have a whole pile of data and you interpret it and you think, okay, now what? So you probably want to think of those things, you know, before you get started uh, in uh, a very large and complex genomic epidemiology program. Uh, so there are uh, a number of challenges to also consider. So the first of which being whole genome sequencing data. So it sounds sort of straightforward and simplistic that you need or to consider standardized nomenclature for automated process of data, sample name and file name, all these things, but they can take a long time to really get set uh, and uh, have consistency across all your sample and file naming. And you need a genomics database that tracks the samples and captures sequencing related data. Uh, there is loads of data that comes with whole genome sequencing. And then obviously you also have all your epidemiological data. So you need everything from what type of sequencer it was sequenced on, uh, what type of sample you received, uh, what is the quality control metrics, which there are many, many of. And then of course you have these whole genome sequencing files, which are very large. So you need sufficient physical storage capacity to be able to maintain this. Um, and you need to organize them in some sort of hierarchical file structure so that you can automate your downstream processes. So if you're doing a small project where you have, you know, a few dozen, yeah, things can be done manually. If you're doing something like SARS-CoV-2, where you're sequencing hundreds or thousands every single week, uh, you can't be doing that manually unless you have a really big team to be able to do that. Uh, you also need to consider your epidemiological data. So I had mentioned, do, does anyone collect that data? Okay, if they collect it, where do they enter it? Do they enter it, um, the data that's relevant to what you need for surveillance and outbreaks? And is it in sort of standardized fields? So if you're using, say, CCM or IFAS, uh, or is it in the case note? So in the case of tuberculosis, People are treated for sometimes over a year. And so a lot of the information doesn't necessarily go in standardized fields, particularly where, say, it's a shelter outbreak or something. That information, you kind of have to read through all the case notes, which is less than ideal and obviously slows things down. And so you really want routine and automated data extraction from whatever your database is in which you have epidemiological information, probably also want some sort of laboratory information uh, to link all of this to the whole genome sequencing outputs. Data analysis and communication is a really important part. So even if you get through all of that, how are you going to tell people and people that are probably not so familiar with genomics uh, what your results are and also what the caveats of your results are were probably just as important, if not the most important, to say how certain you feel about your findings. So you need, for the analysis part, you need, as I mentioned previously, personnel with a combination of epi, bioinformatics, evolutionary biology expertise. You also need to have an understanding of the disease and the pathogen-specific knowledge. Uh, 
you then need effective means to communicate. So in this case, to both TB genomic epidemiology to your stakeholders. So those individuals that are uh, doing the care and treatment of uh, persons with TB. So timeliness of alerts to possible transmission and outbreaks and in, uh, investigations is important if you want it to be actionable. So some of you may be familiar with OutTB Web. So this is the sort of brainchild of Dr. Fran Jameson and myself. Uh, we started this many years ago at Public Health Ontario um, and other individuals uh, at PHO have been involved, including Alex Marshall Austin and Kirby Cronin and have uh, really grown this application in that individuals in the province at public health units that have access to, to TB case data are then granted secure access to this online platform in which they can look up their case and identify if they cluster. Currently, it's by genotyping methods, so that mirror Vinter, and we're looking to move that over to include whole genome sequencing. So this is one way to communicate. But of course, in public health, we really like our reports, particularly those that we can fax. So uh, here is a prototype of something that I've been working on uh, with several provinces and territories to uh, be able to then provide for an outbreak cluster a summary report. So it would give you some information about the total number of cases, sort of the identifier, the, case, the date of last diagnosis, and then an epi curve by, say, health region or whatever the most appropriate breakdown might be for that case. We provide some, you know, what is the demographics of this cluster? What are the clinical features of this cluster? So in this case, it's more than 90% of the cases have pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, as I said, sort of we get a bit of a measure of infectiousness through cavitary and smear uh, positivity. And then in this case, uh, risk factors. So are these individuals undercast? Uh, this prototype cluster is nearly 80%. Uh, 70% smoke, and a fairly high proportion of those uh, have illegal drug use. So it gives some context to the cluster itself. The whole genome sequencing results, we always need to provide some level of QC to know how, how confident we can feel in, in the interpretations. So in this case, you know, everything past the quality control metrics, one sample of the cluster has not yet been sequenced. Uh, we can get some lineage information and then uh, antimicrobial resistance based on the whole genome sequencing. So this is not the laboratory testing. This is the uh, from the prediction of the mutations uh, or genes that might be present in the genome sequencing results. Here we have a phylogenetic tree with this, all these bright colors are an indication of the mutations. So this particular cluster we see at the bottom, uh, so many of them are genetically identical. So there's no variation between them. So in that case, we have to rely really heavily on the epidemiology and less so on the uh, whole genome sequencing results because all it's telling us is that they're clustered and you know, we definitely have an outbreak cluster. In this case, there are two provinces involved in which we knew an individual had arrived from another province and unfortunately was infectious and had uh, sort of seeded actually this outbreak. And then we can see there's a number of individuals that have just say one mutation and they're usually sort of the end of the line where we don't see any further um, individuals that have a matching mutation to them. So probably they haven't transmitted to anybody. So tuberculosis uh, transmission network. So unfortunately at this point, this is a very manual process. So this is sort of slogging through all the epidemiological, clinical, laboratory data, and overlaying with the whole genome sequencing to produce sort of a, a, a plausible transmission network. This transmission cluster is uh, super complicated. You can see in light gray, there's a lot of sort of unknown or uncertain connections with the dark lines representing some fairly known uh, uh, linkages between individuals. The blue indicates that they had cavitary disease, uh, so probably the more infectious individuals. This was probably uh, one of the most challenging uh, outbreak reconstructions. And of course, you always need some technical notes to go with the report. 
So in conclusion, genomics offers a deeper understanding of infectious disease epidemiology. When we pair this with active surveillance programs, we can definitely resolve more outbreaks. We can suggest new modes of transmission, potentially reveal new reservoirs of disease. You know, however, obviously a caveat, implementation of public health genomic epi programs remain challenging for pretty much everyone in the world. You know, we're not unique in Canada of these challenges, and it requires significant investments in infrastructure and personnel with the appropriate expertise. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, all my collaborators and coworkers over the years that I've worked with uh, that has produced uh, all, a lot of that data that I've shown. So in British Columbia and in Ontario uh, in Yukon territory, and they were fabulous to work with. Uh, I have to say, uh, definitely a friendly bunch. And I got to go to Yukon territory a number of times uh, to work with them. And then my uh, collaborators at Oxford University uh, or University of Oxford, they're fantastic as well, Derek Cook and Tim Walker. So thank you to everybody uh, for all the contributions to this work. And uh, I will hand it over to Melissa for uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Guthrie. That was a really wonderful presentation. I love um, how you kind of broke everything down for us and it kind of gave it a more of a, a high level, which I think uh, some of us can, can really appreciate. Um, so now we're going to move to the Q&A pod to address some of the questions. So please, those who have not put your questions in already, uh, please continue to do so. Um, so the first question we have here, what are the technical challenges to automating more components of creating transmission networks? Hmm. <laughs> So uh, I think probably the biggest challenge other than the physical construction of the network is the availability of data, the epidemiological clinical laboratory data in a standardized format um, and also in a way that it's able to be routinely linked. So, you know, if we can't do that, then the actual physical creating of the structure uh, is sort of a moot point. So I think that's a hurdle that uh, I know in the work that I'm doing uh, with British Columbia and I've continued to do, that's been one of the sticking points of how do we get that data in a format that you could then automate the construction of those things. Thank you. Um, our next question, do you have any recommendations for software to create transmission diagrams or are all these created manually? At this time, they're created manually. So this is one of the things my lab will be working on uh, to be able to automate this. So unfortunately, uh, see me in the future. Hopefully, I will have a solution for you. Yes, please do let us know. <laughs> um, and then another question is, how has SARS-CoV-2 pandemic changed the landscape for infectious disease genomic epi, in your opinion? Uh, I think it, well, I hope that as long as it's sort of the effort that has been put in is maintained, uh, which as we know in public health is always the challenge is once you build something is, you know, can you get sufficient resources and support to, to keep it going? So I think there's more awareness. I think uh, prior to the pandemic, most of these, the work in genomic epidemiology had been largely research-based. So I think now we're moving into a point where enough people are convinced that it does have things to offer and more to offer than just outbreaks. So it, we can get really good surveillance data from it if you set up your surveillance program properly um, in that you're able to get a representative sample, which we know for SARS-CoV-2 right now is a bit challenging given the restriction in testing. So you have to think through those issues, but I think there's a lot more awareness and hopefully that will translate into support resources and otherwise. Great, thank you. And and do you think that, um, I know you and I kind of both have a bias, but um, what do you think a priority pathogen for genomic epi would be at this time? Uh, I guess it depends on, in terms of priority surveillance or for outbreak detection or things like that. So yes, of course, TB, I think TB, it, of course, not just because uh, it's my passion, but 
because uh, in terms of a pathogen, uh, it, it's a high burden in terms of resource, in terms of the patients. People get very sick from TB. They require very lengthy treatment. Uh, it is treatable. Um, so it is something that we really want to prevent. But there are also some STIs that uh, can do well with a good surveillance program, uh, as well as obviously some viral infections, including SARS-CoV-2, and you know, say maybe sentinel surveillance of uh, influenza that would be quite informative. Thank you. Um, another question from the Q&A pod, are whole genome sequencing results more portable, or is it hard to compare results with other labs and countries? I think SARS-CoV-2 has probably shown us that it, it is quite portable, um, but I would say not necessarily 100%. So SARS-CoV-2 is probably the ideal example in that sort of because it was for a public health pandemic response, everybody has sort of gotten on board and worked out uh, much of the bioinformatics in the QC. Not perfectly, but considered uh, considering other pathogens in which they have been research-based and everybody's sort of using different pipelines and, and so on and different ways to sequence, uh, it definitely presents more challenges. So it's quite good, but one of the things, and I'm part of an international group and that we're pushing for more QC standards to be released along with the data. And so that way you have more information to be able to understand what people have done and what the QC is, and then to be able to use it, say, for context to say your own outbreak or surveillance program and that. So but it is pretty portable, but you probably need a bunch of metadata to really feel comfortable using it. Do you know if there's any, or are you even participating in any um, efforts to um, make this data more portable in the context of TB? I know we've seen that it's been the case for SARS-CoV-2, but is, are there certain groups that are putting efforts um, into making kind of sharing data internationally for TB? So I'm part of the Cryptic Consortium, uh, which is a very long name, essentially looking at antimicrobial resistance prediction. And so it's a really large international group and all the sequencing from that, which is uh, 15,000 TB isolates that have been collected around the world, have all been deposited to NCBI SRA, so which is this uh, archive in which we put whole genome sequencing results. So everybody is encouraged to contribute the results and that is freely available to download those sequences. And, and I definitely know that our group has um, done some contributions yeah. to that. Yeah, Public Health Ontario and BC through the connections that I have, we've, we've contributed to the sequencing too. So I think the tricky part and same with SARS-CoV-2 is always to be able to do that in a routine capacity. Unfortunately, you know, we don't control NCBI and how easy or difficult it is to deposit that data. Uh, so it can require some resources to be able to make that data available. Um, okay, thank you. How quickly does Yukon get the whole genome sequencing results now that this process is in place? Uh, it probably depends a little bit uh, in sort of how prioritized they are. So there are, uh, so samples go to BC for testing. So BC already has the samples. Uh, so they are prioritized. One of the challenges that I didn't talk about is that TB being such a slow grower, uh, to be able to get sufficient quantities of DNA can take weeks. Um, and so the turnaround time in terms of being able to um, to act on it at this point is still slow. Uh, although some of us are working on uh, being able to try and sequence from directly from the specimen, but there that's a probably topic for another day to discuss the challenges involved in that. So probably weeks, definitely weeks would be the answer there. Okay, thank you. I would be interested in uh, learning more from you about uh, some of the challenges with direct from specimen is, as well. Um, we have uh, another one here. Is there an optimal population size slash case number to undertake genomic epi as a population level initiative versus analysis of a specific individual outbreak? Does it need to be national level versus provincial? For TB, people move, do move around and we have sometimes connected to other provinces to check for genomic genotyping matches. 
Yeah, I think so. For if we're talking TB specific, so it can probably vary, you know, based on the pathogen. But for TB specifically, I would say that, um, you know, well, TB is I would say easy. It's not easy, but easier in that there is centralization, and so and it's reportable. So everything's going to come. So I think you generally want uh, at minimum thirty percent. Uh, to probably really say anything, but it, I guess again, it depends on if you're sort of surveying for outbreaks and and to detect and potentially prevent outbreaks, or you just want to get a sense of sort of what types of lineages and and the genetic diversity uh, is in the province. But generally speaking, we are able to sequence more, um, probably seventy to eighty percent of all TB cases uh, if we have a routine you know sequencing program up and running. Whether you need to do it a local or provincial or you know countrywide, uh, unfortunately in Canada being provincial, most of it's done uh, within a provincial level and, and probably that is sufficient. Yes, sometimes cases do mo move back and forth. Um, and then the, in the cases where that's happened, usually we are able to contact uh, you know, given that there's only one reference lab per province, uh, people know each other and we all, you know, connect back and forth uh, to be able to transfer that type of data or prioritize somebody's sample to say, oh, we think this, you know, maybe this. So that cluster I showed, an individual had arrived from another province. So they contacted the province to be able to get closely related isolates to sequence to compare to, to identify that, that, that the individual was sort of the seed, the source case. Yeah, um, and I'm just I'm just wondering, like to to kind of go along with that as as well, and uh, presenting the presenting data to external stakeholders. If you like, I, I love the the reports that you showed, and I, I'm wondering where if those reports are currently in you say at the BCCDC, or if that's just something that you're developing to kind of offer to others. Um, and also what the, maybe the best way to present whole genome sequencing data to others, like the external stakeholders would be. Yeah, so currently it's a prototype. Um, uh, so I consult for BCCDC, so working with them. There's a field EPI currently that's just joined in British Columbia, who's also gonna be working with us to be able to uh, sort of survey people to make sure that we capture uh, what they are looking for and build a report that provides the best information in the most straightforward way, as much as you can with genomics, uh, and also to build some educational materials. Unfortunately, you know, uh, genomics is complicated and uh, the caveats of it can be quite complicated. Uh, and so we, we need to do more work there. And so that work uh, I'll be doing with BC and uh, we'll share with obviously other provinces and territories. Yeah, I think we would definitely be interested. In, and that's something that we continue to reflect upon internally at PHO as well as what is, what is the best way that we can present this, this data and, and how, um, can we yeah, present the data? How, what kind of educational resources can we develop for um, our external partners as well? So um, yeah. Do you have any examples of how genomic results, either prospective or retrospective, have been used for public health policy changes? Uh, I do from some work again that I had done in BC. So in that case, uh, it's a, a study I didn't show here for time, is a pediatric study uh, in which uh, most people assume that, uh, so either children that develop tuberculosis who had been uh, born in another country in which it's endemic, so they were probably representing reactivations, uh, and everybody else has locally acquired their infection and most likely from a family source. Uh, in many cases, this is true. There's one aspect that uh, uh, had been overlooked that this study revealed in that uh, especially children will often go back to the parents' uh, place of birth, uh, country, and they don't stay in hotels, in luxury hotels. They stay in the community with family in an endemic region that uh, exposes them potentially to tuberculosis. Um, and so in screening, so we screen when individuals, you know, immigrate to Canada to see if they have an active infection. 
that requires treatment prior to arrival. But for those who just go and travel and spend the summer with grandparents, and particularly if they are born in Canada, then there's there's no screening um, that would occur. Uh, there would be nothing to fly through that. So in doing that work in BC, that has been put on the radar to be able to uh, to be aware of that and to offer screening to individuals in which there is a sort of known lengthy stay, uh, community stay in countries in which uh, TB is endemic, and for most of those, their sort of uh, their parents were born in an endemic country, and the the children have traveled back either with parent or or you know maybe a teenager on their own. So yeah, definitely uh, there are areas in which the genomic epi can offer some uh, policy and practice changes. That's just one example. That's great. I'm, I'm sure there there'll be many more as well. Um, and then be just to kind of finish up, we have. Uh, one more kind of a suggestion um, and uh, also as a posed as a question as well in our chat box, and that is, has there been any discussion about incorporating genomic data into routine national or provincial TB surveillance reporting? And our attendee thinks that we should do it if it hasn't happened. <laughs> um. Great if there is resources to do so. So uh, the only province that's really routinely sequencing uh, is BC. Um, I know Alberta has been trying to get up and running and Ontario and other provinces. So until that happens, then we can't incorporate it. Um, it would be very biased basically to British Columbia's data. Um, and the, each province and territory has a very different story of TB. Uh, so who has TB, if there's transmission or what level of transmission there is, uh, as we know, the provinces are all quite geographically and in many cases population can be quite different in that there's more regions of remote versus uh, urban populations and so on. And so given that TB is a very social disease, uh, there is an impact there. So until uh, everybody is able to gain the resources and infrastructure and expertise needed, unfortunately, we're not able to build a, a national program with the genomic part of it. That being said, we will work on it. Yes. So we're in progress. I think that's always that's everybody's end goal to get there, but we're just not quite there yet. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for taking the time to answer all of those uh, great questions. Um, so as we wrap up today's PHO microbiology round sessions, I would like to give a big thank you to Dr. Guthrie for presenting. I'd also like to thank you all for uh, joining today's session. You can expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHO microbiology round survey for today's session, and please try to complete this to help us improve our programming. And lastly, to access past PHO rounds presentations and view confirmed upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to education and events, and click on presentations. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.